Trevilian Next is a division of Trevilian, a financial services specialist search and talent advisory firm. Since inception, the Trevilian team has dedicated itself to enhancing the return on investment of a company's most important resource, its people. Welcome everyone, thanks for tuning in and I'm extremely excited about today's event. A quick introduction, I'm Brian Love, your co-moderator for today and head of banking and fintech at Trevilian, a boutique executive recruitment firm serving the financial services space since 1998. Yes, next year will be our 25th anniversary. My division specifically covers community banks around the country, assisting with succession planning and executive search for boards, executives and senior leadership teams. Please connect with us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or YouTube, and visit www.trevilliangroup.com to sign up for our mailing list and learn about our bank practice and current search engagements. And now on to our program for today. So bank sector performance tends to vary over the course of the economic cycle. Along the way, balance sheets and margins expand or contract. Credit is alternately benign or challenging, capital is plentiful or scarce, M&A is active or dormant, and the regulatory, the re regulatory pendulum can swing from overly permissive to the opposite extreme. For most banks, their performance and stock market valuation ebbs and flows based on the real or perceived impact to their business model of these outside economic factors. However, there are a select few banks that always seem to buck the trend, and they trade with premium valuation multiples that are sustained through the business cycle. We highlighted this topic in an article we published a few weeks ago, and today we're going to, to delve into it in more detail with two special guests. And so with that being said, I'd like to turn the floor over to my co-moderator, Joe Fennick. Joe, good to see you. Thanks, Brian, good to see you also. Um, so just a little background, this project really came about when I was asked by a community bank management team to present to uh, their board of directors. It was a really a typical sort of request to talk about the state of the industry, investor perceptions of the company, um, but there was one specific question that management wanted me to address with their board, and that was, why do certain bank stocks tend to trade at super premium valuations, not just you know higher than average, but the next level up from that? And why does the list of those banks tend to not vary all that much from year to year? You know, what do those what do those banks do differently than everyone else? And what are the common traits that they share with each other? Um, the management team of this bank also made clear that they had already considered some of the more obvious traits like strong, consistent profitability through the cycle an excellent credit track record and things of that nature. And they concluded that there had to be just something else, another set of variables that linked these highly valued companies together. So that was really the impetus for, for this project and the research. And I don't know that we could say definitively that we, that we discovered the answer, uh, but there were some commonalities, some common traits we found uh, that were somewhat surprising and also interesting, I think, in the sense that they were things that we had never really considered before. Um, so here to talk about this topic in more detail from that really short list of banks, there were 13 banks on the list, are two CEOs that are among the most highly respected leaders in the banking industry. Uh, Mark Trunisky has been with Community Bank System, uh, the ticker CBU, based up in DeWitt, New York, for nearly 20 years. Um, Mark served as the president and CEO of that company since 2006. It was right around that time that I was assigned research coverage of the stock by the firm I was working for at the time, and I followed it closely ever since. Um, I think the best way really to learn and understand the banking business is to have the privilege to observe the best managed and best performing companies up close. And there's no better example of that, in my opinion, than community bank system. And that's a testament to Mark's leadership. Mark, it's been a long time. Great to see you again. It has been, Joe. Thanks for having us. And I would just add that. Um in my uh, 18 years with Community Bank, and we've had a lot of analysts come and go, but you were the uh, most insightful, most accurate, uh, and most objective analyst that we've uh, we've ever had. So we, we miss you, but uh, welcome to your new role. I appreciate that, Mark. Thanks very much. Um, Tom, I, I never had the privilege to cover Service First Bank. On the other hand, ticker SFBS is an analyst, but I've been an admirer for a long time. Tom Broughton is the chairman and CEO of the company. 
uh, which he founded in 2005 in Birmingham, Alabama, and took to the public markets through an IPO in 2014. Um, of the 13 highest valued banks in the country that we highlighted on this list, Service First uh, has the distinction of being the top performing stock of those 13 banks over the past decade, uh, with a return of nearly eight times the banking index. So quite a feat there. Tom, thanks very much for being here. Thank you, Joe. I look forward to it. So maybe just to kick things off, I know that you know many of our viewers are probably at least somewhat familiar with each of your companies, but both are very well-known, larger-sized community banks. Uh, but maybe for those that aren't as familiar, can you each take a couple of minutes to introduce your company and talk a little bit about the business model and the strategy? And maybe if you're willing to do that, we'll lead off with Mark and then and then turn to Tom. Sure. Thanks, Joe. Um, well, uh, Community Bank System has been around for a long time, about 160 uh, years or so. Um, we started in the North Country in New York State. Um, which is a very non-metropolitan kind of market, continued to grow uh, over time from there, um, principally in non-metropolitan markets. Um, our you know, business model has been a combination and, and growth strategy has been a combination of uh, organic growth and uh, acquired uh, M&A uh, transactions over the years. Um, we, you know, the, the, the business model, uh, we are a, uh, our balance sheet's very diversified. So uh, we are a commercial bank, but we also have a significant uh, retail business as well, because in the non-metropolitan markets where there's uh, less concentration of other institutions, you need to, for the most part, provide uh, a breadth of products and services to those markets, which, which we do. Um, I think one of the, the other elements of our evolution is that we started investing years ago in uh, some non-banking businesses. So we have a very significant benefits business. Uh, we have a uh, uh, one of the largest uh, insurance businesses of any bank uh, in the U.S. And we also have a, a wealth management business. So those three businesses are almost a third of the revenues of the company. So that's kind of a, a diversifying uh, feature of the company uh, as well. You know, I would say that as we've kind of grown to the point where we are now in this Kind of 15 to 16 billion dollar range, um, it, it has become a bit more difficult to grow in these smaller markets. One, because the growth in those markets is less, but also because as you get larger in terms of scale, you have the, you know, the, 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 the wherewithal, the, the, the capital capacity, the talent internally to do bigger things. And so we have gravitated to slightly larger markets. Um, with that said, they're still not considered large markets. They're just larger than rural markets. So, you know, places like, uh, you know, Albany, New York and Buffalo, New York, and Syracuse, New York, and, uh, you know, Scranton, Wilkes-Barre in Pennsylvania, Burlington, Vermont. So, you know, towns like that that are larger than our historical kind of legacy franchise, but still not uh, as large as, uh, you know, the, t the town that Tom does business in, in, in Birmingham. So that's a quick snapshot, uh, Joe. Great, appreciate that overview, Mark. Tom? Yeah, Joe, uh, service first is really three things. We're wholesale commercial bank, uh, we're a community bank, and we're also a uh, correspondent bank. Uh, we have 24 branches, four LPOs. Uh, we serve, we have 11 regional CEOs uh, that we build around in a geographic uh, management model. And our correspondent vision serves 350 correspondent banks and 140 agent credit card and purchasing card banks. So that's, you know, we, what we say we are is we say we're a discipline growth company that sets high standards for performance. Great. Appreciate that overview as well. So one of the more, uh, maybe just diving right in here, one of the more fascinating results, I think, of our research on this specific topic, in my view, is that of the 13 banks that are, that are the highest valued in the industry, only one bank, and that's Tom's Bank, Service First, was founded during the century. And the median founding year of the 13 banks was 1904, uh, almost 120 years ago. Community bank system, as Mark alluded to earlier, dates back further than that to right around the end of the Civil War, 1866. So, Mark, it would seem to me that there's something to be said for that being long established and long entrenched in your markets. 
And that's evident in the fact that CBU is far and away the dominant bank in terms of you know, low cost deposit market share in most of the markets, almost all the markets you do business in. It's just a durable competitive advantage that you'll always have. Do you see this as more coincidental that most of the banks uh, that have had the success you all have had have this sort of common trait? Or do you see it as, as, we, as we did as one of the key drivers of that success? Yeah, I don't know that the longevity, Joe, um, is necessarily a key driver of success. I think you look at Times Bank, that's a good example of, uh, of the fact that you don't need longevity to, uh, you know, to be high performing. Um, you know, I think, you know, for us, we talked a little bit about kind of the metro markets and the, you know, the evolution from rural to uh, more metropolitan, but still not, you know, large city markets. Um, but I think you'd, you'd also touched on the, the deposit based and the low cost core deposits. You know, one of the things when I first started with, I, I came from PricewaterhouseCoopers, so I was more in the kind of accounting finance world and less in the banking world. And so I did a kind of analysis as a new CEO is how do I make a difference here in terms of shareholder value? And so in looking at other banks that were really successful at the time and looking at kind of the commonality, the funding base uh, was one of those kind of commonalities that struck me as a way to make a difference. And, you know, I think if you look at what we all do, um, you know, funding, we're all making the same loans for the most part at the same rates with the same structure. Uh, but you can, you can differentiate yourself uh, with funding. And so that's the path that we decided to take um, and have focused on that, that core deposit funding, you know, for a long time. 75% uh, of our deposit base is checking and savings accounts. So, um, you know, that's, I think that's served us well, that, that low cost deposit base, particularly when rates are, are higher. Um, when rates go lower, it, uh, you know, it's probably more of a drag given the, the cost of carry, you know, on that. Um, but for us in, in our business model, in the markets that we serve, uh, the, the core funding base has been a, you know, a competitive advantage for us for, you know, for a long time. And in fact, you know, right now, if you look at the, uh, you know, the interest rate environment, uh, those core deposits uh, are creating value every day, uh, which is really helpful because they have extremely low beta. I mean, our beta is very low. So uh, I think that's been helpful for us. But with that said, there are other, diff there are different business models that work without, uh, that core funding advantage. So Mark, I go back a long way with you guys, but not as long as the period you're talking about. Did you, did, did, did that transformation in terms of the deposit base, was that always there, the core funding base, or did you guys do a lot to kind of affect that, um, you know, in the period of time that you've been with the company? Yeah, that was one of my initial strategies, Joe, just uh, as a, you know, uh, new CEO that, uh, that had a lot to learn about how to make money in the banking business. And so it just, it, it, was, it was kind of a, a strategy that we, that we started uh, in earnest about, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago is focusing on those kind of core checking and savings accounts and lower cost deposits. I mean, our, when we do uh, you know, core deposit studies, our average checking account has a life of 14 years. So there's a lot of stickiness to those accounts and there's a lot of opportunities to sell other products and services to those accounts as well. I mean, if you ask someone, you know, who you bank with, they're probably going to tell you, you know, where their checking account is, right? That's, I bank with, you know, community bank. So, you know, we, we kind of viewed that as a core starting point for building the business, you know, over time and it's, you know, served us well today. Tom, as I mentioned earlier, of the 13 banks, Service First is, is the outlier on this question. The bank's only 17 years old. Um, you're also just about the only bank on the list that favors some of the higher growth, more metro markets. All the other banks are based in decidedly non-metro markets. So I have the same question sort of in reverse for you. You know, What is it about Service First and your philosophy in running the business that you think has enabled the company to be so successful as a new entrant into more vibrant markets that tend to be very competitive? And why do you think Service First stands virtually alone among banks that look like you in terms of how the market views your stock relative to some of these other companies? Yeah, Joe, whether we're in a 
a community bank market or a major metropolitan market, we focus on owner managed companies. You know, we're a business bank. So, and, and much to, to Mark's point, you know, we don't want, you know, a, a volatile money market deposit from a customer. We want their core operating accounts. We want, you know, we want the property management company that's got, you know, 150 checking accounts and 80 reserve accounts. And that's, that's the profile of the customer that we want and we focus on. So, and whether, you know, what market when we focus on the same sort of customer base. And so, you know, it takes longer to get established in the major metropolitan areas. It takes years to gain any name recognition whatsoever. It's much quicker in the smaller markets, but there's there's more potential in the larger markets. So we like a we've we've come to grow to appreciate a combination of both more so than we've ever done before. So I, you know probably half our markets are you know metropolitan, half are, are community bank you know markets that we, we serve today. Mark, maybe back to you for a follow-up question here. It's, you know, like you mentioned, um, you're not in the most economically vibrant markets in the country, so the growth isn't easy to come by. You talked about going to some of the more metro-type markets in and around your footprint. Uh, but on the flip side, the markets are also aren't as prone to boom and bust cycles. So similar to my earlier question about the value of being entrenched in your markets, there does seem to be a strong correlation between the banks on the list, uh, this list, that are so highly valued and the fact that the vast majority of them don't tend to operate in markets that are growing robustly. I mean, in your opinion, why do you think that is? Um, I, I'm not sure, Joe. I, you know, I think that, you know, our, we've always focused on shareholder value. So that's our, we want to win. We don't care if our growth is the fastest, if our ROA is the highest, if, you know, we have the best asset. Our ultimate goal is double digit shareholder returns over time. And we do that with a combination of, you know, three to 5% organic growth on earnings, three to 5% organic accretion from disciplined M&A in a, you know, two to 3% dividend over time. You add those all together, you get a plus 10% return. Um, and that's really our goal. We, that's kind of the way we articulate that to, to shareholders. And I think we've, we've been able to do it with, with and I think our, our shareholder return over the last 15 years is double digits. So we've achieved it for, you know, a long, over an extended period of time, which you don't get to every year because of the market, but over time, that's the goal. And it's a pretty simple strategy. And we are, have articulated that to, uh, to our investors as well. So the focus is really on, on, you know, shareholder value. And I think, you know, the way you achieve that in banking is, you know, to me, I know, and I read your article, which I thought was really interesting and very insightful. Um, one of the things I think I would add to that list of what's the secret sauce is, and Tom already used this word, it's discipline. So I don't think it matters what your business model is. There's a lot of business models that can be successful. I don't think it matters if you're in rural markets, you know, metropolitan markets, or something in between. I think if you bring discipline to your business model, whatever it is, and you execute with discipline, you will be successful. And so I think that's an important uh, point to make as well. You don't, I don't think you need to be in high growth markets to be successful. I think you, but you do need discipline. And I think the history of banking is littered with examples of banks that grew too fast and they, you know, they blew up and we do a lot of ag lending because of our markets and the farmers have a saying, if it grows too fast, it's probably a weed. And, you know, you can see that in the history of banking, you know, as well. So I think you can operate in high growth markets if you're disciplined. You can operate in low growth markets if you're disciplined. And I think you can deliver, you know, superior shareholder returns, you know, if you're disciplined. So I would just add that to the kind of uh, list of uh, secret sauces in your analysis, Joe. So another commonality that emerged from our research on these highly valued banks uh, is that while there were five banks on the list of the 13 that were fairly active acquirers, CBU being obviously one of those over the years, the other eight are not all that active on the M&A front, and some like Service First are virtually inactive. So Tom, Service First's reputation is that of an outstanding organic grower. From your perspective, and you have done an acquisition in the past, but from your perspective, why hasn't an active M&A strategy been the right fit for your company? And do you think it's coincidental 
that the majority of the other highly valued companies on the list are also not all that acquisitive? You know, I, I think it comes back to, to being a discipline acquirer, if you're going to be an acquirer, but we're not an acquirer for several reasons. One is, first of all, we've had a fairly rapid growth rate and we don't want to outgrow our back office and we don't want our service to suffer. And so, you know, we just think that if we had an active acquisition program, that would add another layer of, of complexity to and stress on our back office that probably don't think it's a good idea to, to, to introduce that into the equation. Uh, second is we don't have any particular expertise in acquisition. So why would we do it? We don't, you know, we don't know what we're doing. Uh, we know how to grow organically. So, and I, the third thing is I've, I've noticed that most banks that make a lot of acquisitions, you know, they grow their way into mediocrity sooner or later. You know, that sometimes they start as a pretty good bank and then I've watched them and they are, they just get to be pretty average after a while. And then I guess the, the fourth reason is, you know, the investment bankers all bring us, you know, models showing how they make financial sense to do these acquisitions. And it's just financial engineer. And it, it makes financial sense given our PE and our price to book, but it doesn't make strategic sense, you know, from that standpoint. So that's, that's why we just stay away from. It. And I think probably the ones that just buy anything to make their numbers dance, I would not call them strategic acquirers. And, you know, I think Mark would say, he would probably say that's the number one thing is what's the best strategic fit for them. No, I think it's a great point. And look, I make this mistake as much as anybody as analysts and investors looking in from the outside. It's easy for us to say, oh, just do this, cut expenses by this much, or just acquire this bank over here. And we we sometimes make the the uh, the mistake that thinking it's just as easy as flipping a switch. And obviously, obviously it's not. And so, uh, no, I think it's a great point. Uh, Mark, even among the the five most active, uh, the five more active acquirers on the list, I should say, CBU included, maybe you know a real distinguishing characteristic, and I think this goes to Tom's point that we found was that on average, the largest deal that each company had completed in their entire history only amounted to about 18% of the buyer's asset size. And no bank on the list had ever completed a deal for a company whose asset size was greater than 45% of the buyer's asset size at the time. And you've always communicated specifically to the market. I think you did it as recently on your third, on the third quarter earnings call, uh, not to expect CBU to take on acquisitions beyond a certain asset size threshold relative to the size of your company. So judging by the data on this, the market really seems to prefer that more incremental approach to M&A as opposed to a more transformative M&A strategy. Like Tom said, companies just doing acquisition after acquisition. Why do you think that is? Um, why do you think it's the right approach and why is it the right strategy for CBU? Well, I think for us historically, in order to achieve that double digit shareholder return, Joe, uh, we weren't gonna get there just with organic growth. And I think for us, uh, you know, we didn't want to be mediocre. And so we have over the years supplemented our organic growth and the growth of our non-banking businesses, which has also been mostly organic uh, with what I would call disciplined M&A and disciplined in the sense of not just kind of the pricing, but the, you know, strategic sensibility uh, of, the, of the transaction to us. So, you know, with our multiple, we can buy almost everything. I mean, there's almost nothing and Tom could do the same thing, uh, but we don't. And you have to be very selective and very disciplined about what makes sense for you and what makes sense for your shows. The other thing I would tell you is if you look at the, all the models and we've looked at millions of them, um, the smaller deals have much higher um, return on invested capital than larger deals. And so, for example, if you run a model on four banks at, 500 million or 750 million and you add up the the economics let's call it earnings accretion uh and i i would say cash earnings accretion like let's take out the balance sheet noise which is non-cash because that's not economic value um the the sum total of the 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 the, the cash accretion on those four deals is going to vastly exceed the cash creation on one deal that's four times that size, vastly. So the return per dollar of invested capital on smaller transactions is higher. 
And it's got a lot to do with pricing. It's got to do with the impact of cost saves. It's got to do with the risk of execution. There's a lot of reasons for it. But um, so doing larger transactions is a typically, and we've seen this in history, right? Um, a clear path, as Tom said, towards mediocrity. So, you know, we don't want to be mediocre. Um, and we know there's a risk if we do a big transaction that we become mediocre. And so, you know, that will uh, not be our strategy you know, anytime into the future. And we will continue to be disciplined about uh, how we incorporate m and No, it's a great point. And then uh, irrespective of size, though, Mark, maybe a follow up there. I'm sure the investment bankers are in your office all the time pitching you deals that are on paper are enormously accretive, you know, small, large, whatever. Um, you know, the 50 basis point ROA legacy thrift up in New England or down in New Jersey, the franchise extenders, if you will, there's a lot of those, right? Um, but looking at the deals you've done, consistent with what you said about smaller size deals, but they've also never been sort of fixer upper type deals. Um, so back to your point on discipline, is that part of it? Is that not sort of going for the deal that on paper is so for the, like, are there risks that we don't see from the outside as to why those fixer upper deals tend not to work so much, or is it just not the right fit for CBU? Yeah, I, I, I think Joe, it's just that there's a, in some of those fixers up, there's uppers, there's a lot of work to do. Um, and, and it depends, I would say, you know, we've, we've acquired, at least one I can think of bank in the past that I would argue had some credit issues. Um, but the credit issues were uh, not as significant as what was suggested in the deal. They got into a argument with the regulators. The regulators honestly blew it out of proportion for personal reasons. And so we went and looked at the portfolio and said, you know, this is a great opportunity to buy a bank at a, at a, at a, at a you know, discount from a normal kind of premium and the credit's not that bad. So that was a modest fixer up. I think, you know, the things that are really hard to fix up, you can't fix culture is really hard. So, you know, we've walked away from opportunities before that we've gotten into in terms of diligence because of culture. Uh, if, if the cultures don't align, you need to walk. Um, you know, you can, you can fix, uh, you can fix a balance sheet pretty quick. Um, you know, we've never just bought anything that was a credit bomb uh, before, uh, mainly because you don't know the extent. Even if you do diligence, you're not really, you know, 100% sure. So you have to you have to really discount the pricing model uh, to, you know, address the, the risk and uncertainty associated with credit. So we haven't ever bought a kind of credit fix rupture. I would tell you the two things are difficult to fix. One is culture. And number two is a, a deposit base that's not productive. So a, a really high cost deposit base is, is hard to fix uh, quickly um, and culture is hard to fix, but other things, you know, you can, you can work on. You know, to follow up on, on Mark's point, you know, we go and visit these banks and, and talk to them and, you know, somebody, what, what do you think? You think we ought to buy them? I said, we don't have any magic dust to sprinkle over these people, <laughs> you know? And, and so that, you know, I don't think Mark's found any magic dust to sprinkle over people to change them. And, you know, that's probably why he'd want to buy, you know, a, a, an underperforming thrift, you know. And so that's the main reason we've just never bought banks is because that's, you know, one of the primary reasons. And I, I'm like Mark on, on credit issues. You know, my grandfather always said things. They're not usually as bad as they seem in a, in a bank. They're usually have a lot worse. So uh, <laughs> always stay away from problems like that. I'm going to borrow that line for my next. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll jump into the culture and talent uh, conversation. Again, you, you, you guys get an understanding of what Trevelyan does. Talent is my valley wick. One thing we didn't look, uh, we look, we didn't look at it in Joe's article was that what that I think would have been interesting to examine is how many of the companies that made the list had long-term continuity at the senior and middle management levels, as opposed to bringing in new talent over time as companies grow and evolve. So Tom and Mark, you know, you've led your respective companies for just about two decades now. And I wanted to probe how your talent needs evolved over that period. You know, when you look around the table at, at your management group, is it mostly the same faces that have been with you since the start? And if not, 
How do you incorporate new talent into the organization? And is it more difficult to do because the standards you've set uh, are probably different than what bank other banks may use at early, earlier points in their careers at different organizations? So Tom, how about you lead off on this one and then Mark? Sure, I'd be curious to see a study on what sort of turnover there is at the executive level, Brian, but my guess is it's pretty low. Uh, our leadership in 17 years, we've had a few retirements, but we've really had zero turnover at the executive level. And we, we even have a couple of our senior officers are, are in their late seventies and they're still active. And so, you know, we don't have an active, you know, mandatory retirement age or anything like that. So, you know, we're constantly talking to new bankers all the time, all the time, we're talking to, you know, commercial bankers that have in market relationships. So, but we, I, I think it's been probably very stable in most of the successful banks. Yeah. And Mark, before you answer, let me just ask Tom another question there, because you know, you have these leaders that have been there for so, so long, but I'm sure you have an emerging leader leadership group, you know, within the bank as well. How do you keep those people um, developing and excited, you know, to potentially move up themselves? I guess, how do you develop them? Yeah, sort of our, our way of doing it is what we try to do is build a, as, as people grow and they build their book of business, we'll build a team around them. So, you know, we actually have, have bankers that have a $500 million, you know, loan and deposit book within their existing portfolio. But now they have a good size staff and they have, that, that helps them with that. So, but that we're able to continue to grow and, you know, a rising tide raises all boats and it gives a lot of opportunity. So it's never been an issue. And as long as we continue to grow organically, we're not going to have an issue with that. I don't feel, I don't feel Brian. That's okay. interesting. So you almost have like these people have like feel like they're running their own entrepreneurial operation, Tom, would you say? So there's not really a ceiling with somebody sitting above them that's been there for 30 years and isn't likely to retire anytime. So it's almost like you're kind of affording them an entrepreneurial opportunity of their own to grow their business within your company. We are. And we're, you know, we're looking for the, you know, I talked to an organizer of a, a new bank in Vermont yesterday and, you know, he was moaning about trying to uh, attract established bankers away from established banks. And I said, I, I get it. You know, it's, you're looking for the pioneers, not the settlers. And this, we're looking for the 10% of the bankers that are, are willing to make a change. And a lot of them are. So, you know, Mark's got the same problem when he's trying to grow in Buffalo, he's trying to, you know, feel people out of it, you know, they've been 20 years in an existing bank and it's the same problem I have feeling people out. So. Mark, did you want to chime in on this subject? Yeah, I mean, I sure. I think, you know, the initial uh, point, uh, Brian, was around culture. I, I, you know, I would say that starts with leadership and it starts with people and talent. And um, if I am known for one saying in the bank, the thing that I kind of say all the time to people and remind them, and they're probably tired of hearing it, but we are not in the banking business, we're in the people business. And, you know, for us, it's really about people that not only have talent, but have core values. We have kind of an established set of core values that we roll out. We hold people accountable to those. And, um, you know, I think talent and people management is the most important part. Sure. And, and I, you know, I think it's a, such a great point that, you know, you, you mentioned disciplined ex and uh, execution earlier. You've mentioned discipline quite a bit. And execution can't be done without, without the people, the soldiers to do it, right? Um, I can't help but ask, what does discipline execution look like specifically? Like what trait or even competency? And I'm sorry to go off script, but this is really fascinating to me. What does that look like when you hire people? What are you looking for? Um, people that have energy, people that have passion for what they do, uh, people that can articulate um, a mindset around uh, excellence. And, and, and so some of those are really vague concepts, um, but you can get a sense for that when you talk to folks. Look, are, are, you, are you an engineer and an architect or are you a caretaker? I don't want caretakers, right? I want builders. 
Mm. And I think typically you can tell the difference when you're, when you're talking to someone, you spend an hour talking to someone, um, you ask them the right question about what they do in the past and what drives them. And, you know, what, given what you know about us, how, how would you build it? And you can, you can very readily get a sense for whether someone is a caretaker or a builder. Tom, do you, do you agree with that? Or do you have anything you would like to add to that? Oh yeah, I do. And, you know, my, my dad used to say, one thing you'll never learn on an interview is whether people can get along with people. And I think that's the single hardest thing to do is to see if they can get along with people. And that's, a, that's, that's very hard to do in an interview situation. So collaboration and, uh, you know, like executive presence, you know, how you interact, that's important. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I appreciate those perspectives. Um, and I wanted to ask another question. This one is not to shine any light on failures or weaknesses, but I think our audience would love to hear, you know, even great companies can stumble and make mistakes. And obviously the great companies make fewer of them than most, but what would each of you say has been the most significant misstep you've had in your tenures as CEO? Was there a decision you made or event that occurred or a hire you made that just didn't work out? And if so, how quickly did it take you to recognize and correct it? Um, Mark, if you want to start and, and then Tom, you want to chime in? Sure. Um, I would say, I mean, just thinking about that question of the, you know, we all make mistakes. If you don't make a mistake, then you're not learning and you're not growing and you're not getting better at what you do. Um, I don't know that we've ever made a, you know, material mistake or misstep. Um, lots of smaller ones. I think if I look at the two biggest missteps that I made, uh, you know, one was around uh, not investing in more growth oriented talent and resources soon enough. And the others I would put in one bucket, which are not reacting soon enough to uh, leadership and management issues that I needed to do something about. So I would say both of those were kind of, you know, maybe mistakes in different ways, which were not necessarily significant. But as I look back, my, my mistake, if I could do it differently, would not be to change what I did or didn't do, it would be to do it quicker. Mm -hmm. So my advice when I talk to you know, early tenure CEOs is you're going to make mistakes. That's okay. Fix them faster, right? That's that you let things go too long before you fix them. And then you look back and say, okay, I didn't make a mistake, but what I did, I should have done sooner. And that would be my piece of advice for, um, you know, early career CEOs. Yeah, that's a great response, Tom. What's, well, I, your, what's your take? Yeah. I can't help but agree with that. We, we're all waiting on people to improve that never do. You know, and take, when we wait two years for them to improve and then realize they're not going to change and they're not going to improve and we need to do something about it. But I'm not sure that, that I can change on that. I mean, we just continue to give people time to, to change and improve and we just can't seem to do it. But I guess our most critical mistake I made is I always had a, a limit on residential AD and C lending of 10% of the loan portfolio and, and uh, it's substantially less than that today. And the main reason for that is, you know, in 2005 when we opened residential AD and C had really good profitability. It had a 15 year track record of, you know, uh, success. So I let it get up to 15% of our loan portfolio. And then 2008 came along and, you know, saw substantial, you know, our, our, Credit cost in, I think, 2009 went to 90 basis points, which is way too high, uh, less than most of the industry, but still too high. So, you know, the, the answer there is I lost my discipline. You know, if you have discipline, you stick with it. So you don't waive it, you know, no matter when times are good. So I try to remember that now, stick to your discipline and don't, don't change. Interesting. Okay, Tom, on, of the 13 banks on this list, just kind of switching gears a little more, um, your company is is somewhat of an outlier in the sense that 
Most of the banks more closely resemble, as we've discussed, the attributes of a community bank system they do a service first. And that's especially true this year, right? The growth oriented, growth oriented companies tend to qualify for this list when growth is in vogue. And this year, it's definitely not. <laughs> and so most of the growth oriented companies that typically are part of this list have fallen off. And service first is really, if you look at the list, the only one that really remains. What is it that you think the market appreciates about what you all do that leads to that consistent through the cycle super premium valuation that the other growth minded companies don't seem to command in terms of their stock valuation? You know, they're more sort of tied to the cycle as opposed to you guys always being, you know, qualifying for this list as a uh, through the cycle valuation. Yeah, well, I, I, I think a couple of things. One is we are, we're a plain bank. We're just a plain old bank. We don't have specialty lending units or areas. Uh, we're core deposit funded. And I, and I imagine if Mark and I sat down and said, okay, what do you do and what do you not do? I bet our list is probably 90% complete overlap of, you know, the kind of companies and, and businesses they don't bank and the things they do bank. So, you know, I bet you we're, we're more close than, than most people would think that we are in terms of who we bank and how we bank them and that sort of thing. So now we don't have the consumer component that he has, but on the business side, you know, I bet you we have close to hundred percent overlap. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that as maybe you're doing, you know, things very similarly to these other more alike than different to the other banks on this list. It's just the function of, you know, some of the markets you're in and the growth opportunity you're afforded. So maybe you're, you should be more thought about in this bucket with a growth sort of angle because of the markets than, than sort of, like you said, with some of the more niche growth lenders around the country that, that tend to kind of are more in vogue when their particular niche is in vogue. It's an interesting question. Yeah, you know, what, what people forget about there is the parts of the country like, like Mark serves, there's more wealth there. You know, yeah, this, they, they don't have the, the explosive growth that we see in some of the Sunbelt markets, but there's more legacy wealth in, in many of those, you know, markets. And in our correspondent banking business, a good example would be a, <clears throat> a state like Al a bank in Alabama and a, and a bank in Kentucky. The bank in Kentucky's footings will be double those of a correspondent bank in Alabama, just so there's more wealth there, you know, it's, 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 it's outside of the of native Southeast, there's more wealth. So I think that's a plus for banks outside the Sun Belt as well. Tom, I thought it was interesting too, that our analysis revealed that the median asset size of the 13 companies on our list was just over 13 billion, which is a little bit smaller than, than your bank and Mark's bank. A few years ago, though, if you were, we all remember, it was all sort of the rage to be between five and nine billion in assets. Remember, there were all these analyses that showed that those were the highest valued banks because they were the perfect size. You could supposedly big enough to have some good scale while also absorbing the regulatory cost burden, but still small enough to avoid the 10 billion threshold and all the supposed headaches that came along with that. 13 billion was deemed to be just about one of the worst places to be, right? And no one wanted to be just over 10. So my question is, is it somehow easier today to navigate that 10 billion threshold, you think, than it was just a few years ago? Has the industry adapted? Um, have the companies adapted to, to kind of where that discussion uh, just isn't as relevant today as it was just a few years ago, in your view? You know, I'd, I'd be curious to hear Mark's answer on this, but I'll, I'll give you mine. You know, I remember a lot of active investors said, you know, when a bank gets to $9 billion, we sell the stock because they're going to hit that $10 billion threshold and they're going to have this. Now, you know, Mark had to give up the debit card income. Our debit card income for us was less than $300,000, you know, excuse me, not less than $900,000 a year. It's not, it's not a significant, you know, that's a significant amount of money. Don't get me wrong. I'm not minimizing $900,000, but nevertheless, I would see these banks that hit the 10 billion and they announce all these large write-offs. And I think that was just an excuse to, you know, clean some stuff out in my opinion. I don't know what they were doing, but that, you know, first of all, our regulators, we, we've had, you know, a good relationship with our regulators. They're, they're tough, but they're, they've been fair. The FDIC and the state of Alabama banking department, our primary regulators for the bank. And, you know, when we were $7 billion, they came to us and said, look, you're going to cross $10 billion in a couple of years. You've got to start getting ready now. you got to start hiring the people, putting systems in place and get everything ready. So we started 
you know, it wasn't like we hired everybody at one time. We hired them, you know, along. So, you know, it sort of didn't didn't sting too much when we crossed the, the $10 billion mark. We already had the overhead, you know, pretty much in place. So that's sort of our experience with a $10 billion threshold. Mark, anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure I know how others think about it necessarily, Joe. Um, I can tell you how we thought about it was we thought about it like Tom did a couple of years in advance. Um, the regulators didn't tell us to do it. We just realized we were going to cross the, the threshold. And there was two impacts for that. One was regulatory and the other was uh, Durban. And so we just built a plan around that. And we, in fact, we were public. We told our shareholders we will cross $10 billion and it won't hurt earnings. And that's what we did. And so I, it, it just was something that, you know, to me, okay, it's another, it's another speed bump on the path towards prosperity, right? It's just, uh, it's something that you have to address and manage and overcome. And, you know, that's what we did. We moved on. I, you know, the idea that you're going to stay under 10 billion, if, if, if you're, strategy is we're going to stay under 10 billion, then you should not be running the bank. You know, you, you're, you're not, you're not the right person. So I, I, I don't, I can't speak to how others have thought about it, but we just, it's just another thing that we manage every day. Um, and it was a little bigger. And so by the time we crossed 10 billion, we had all the, you know, as Tom said, the resources were already in place, mostly around risk management and that kind of thing. And, you know, the hurdle for the 10 billion in terms of the earnings recapture was we bought a bank in Vermont and we bought a, uh, a benefits business, um, an incredible benefits business uh, in Massachusetts. And the combination of those, so as much as we lost, I think it was an eight digit number in debit because of our retail you know, complement, um, we earned more than that back between those, those two transactions. So you know, we just had a plan a couple of years in advance. We executed on the plan and you know, hurdled the 10 billion and just kept moving forward. It just seemed to be a surprising, and it's interesting perspectives for both of you. It just seemed to be a surprising statistic to me that, you know, like I said, it just seemed to be more of a thing a few years ago. And now we have this list and the average size bank that's the most highly valued in the country is just over that threshold that everyone was so concerned about. One um, thing I just, if I could add something, Joe, and maybe this is a little off script, but okay. one of the things I've noticed just in terms of our bank and in the size we are now, which speaks to kind of, as you said, the kind of the median of this high performing group. One of the things that I will say is that we have the size we're at now, it feels to me like we have a, we're in a sweet spot because we still have a community bank business model. We can still react quickly. Uh, yet we compete now very effectively against the big banks. So I don't know if this is a combination of we're getting better and bigger and it's the scale that we're at and our ability to compete between people and products and all that, or whether it's the big banks are getting even more, you know, difficult from a customer's perspective to view with. Maybe it's a combination of the two, but it feels to me like there's a strategic sweet spot where we're at right now, um, where we have the opportunity to take more market share, let's say, from the bigger banks that we didn't have when we were smaller. That's a really interesting perspective. I, I could see the investment bankers listening to this, revising their pitch decks now that everyone has to be 10 to 20 billion. <laughs> That's I think, the it's, new a, I think it's a good spot to be. I think it's a good spot to be in, to be honest with you. Yeah. I, I just from a size standpoint, because you can still compete in the smaller markets and now you can compete in the bigger markets. And so it just feels like we have this widening of the, you know, the field of play for us right now that feels like it's going to serve us well into the future. Tom, you're right in the size range uh, that Mark is. Uh, do, you, do you agree with that? Oh, completely agree. Uh, we can compete with the community banks and we compete with the larger banks. And one thing is, you know, we're the size that our banks are not siloed yet. And I hope they don't get siloed. But, you know, the big banks are siloed. If a customer has an issue, their banker cannot be responsive to their problems. Their banker has to go to another department who's typically not responsive to the banker. And, and you know, we, you know, in, in, in Mark and I's bank, that's just not acceptable. That's just not acceptable, you know, performance. So with service issues, I think are probably where we shine and, and being responsive to the market. 
I would just add, Joe, if, if I was an investor, I think that's an important uh, element to think about in terms of the ability to grow and the runway that a bank has uh, into the future regarding growth, because you're, you're, you're big enough to take things away from the big banks who, as Tom said, do not react well these days, but you can still compete on a local level as a community bank. And that is a tremendous strategic advantage. I'd like to stick with us for just one more question, if you don't mind, because it's so interesting to me. Um, do you think, and that maybe it's too simplistic of a, of a, of a question here, but do you, where do you think that stops? Where do you think you stop being responsive? Can you kind of look out like to an asset size level or something kind of in the future? You know, and I know you're not there yet, so it might be hard to say, but where, where do you think the line is in terms of where you stop being able to kind of do the things that you're talking about? I'm not sure where that is, Joe. I think that's a fair question. Um, I think when you look at the point where banks become more lethargic, and, and it's not even their fault, right? They're big. So everybody, you know, you're in charge of, you know, pencils and you're in charge of paper and everybody's got a, you know, a silo just because of scale. Um, and so I, I don't think there's anything you can do, you know, to fix that. I don't know where that point is. I mean, it feels to me like we can take our model right here and go from 15 to 30 without skipping a beat. That's what it feels like to me. I, and I don't say that for any particular reason or knowledge or insight or anything. It's just a instinct that, that, you know, maybe it's, maybe the number is 50 billion. I, I don't know, but I think it's a lot more than, I think it's a lot more than 15 because I think we have a lot of opportunity to take a lot of market share away from some of the bigger banks. And so it just feels to me like the number I would throw out there, again, not based on anything other than instinct would, would probably be 2X where we're at anyway. Yeah, and, and Tom, Mark uh, is in a lot of markets that kind of look the same to each other, right, Mark? I mean, they look, they, they're very similar, right? And, and you're contiguous with your franchise, right? Tom, you, you've kind of hopped around a bit to kind of get, get into some markets you really want to be in. It's just really, it's impressive that you've kind of been able to, you know, manage that culture and, and what have you, you know, with a non-contiguous franchise. Does similar question to what I just asked Mark, is that you see sort of a size level where your model becomes, you know, more difficult to, to manage and execute? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I, I think as long as we could preserve our regional CEO model, which I think we can, into the indefinite i mean we think we have a lot of runway ahead of us in terms of you know ability to attract new bankers and continue to grow and in in the attractive southeastern markets where we are today and one way we do that you know our board's concerned about this how, and, and we get this question from active investors is how how much more can you grow before you lose you know whatever you know magic you've had and, and it's a fair question but and I understand it, but, but, but so as, as we've grown and we'll build, we're building now around our regional CEOs and we're, we'll build around them. They are opening subunits of their region. So they are becoming like bank CEOs of their own. So it, it, we see the opportunities is, and I, I'm like, Mark, I can't give you a, a dollar amount, but I think you know, one thing is we need to be strategic about where we expand and how we expand and make sure we do it wisely and be disciplined about it so that we continue to, to show the performance and growth that we've had for the last 17 years for the next 17 years. And I think that's that's the challenge, of course. Uh, just hitting on the hot button issue before I turn it back over to Brian. Um, just a year ago, guys, this list of highly valued banks would have included several banks that would be considered to be tech forward or on the cutting edge of technology. You know, fintech was the all the rage. Um, that's obviously cool. Um, but the banks that have had staying power on this list through the cycle, like your two banks, for instance, would not be included. I would say, fair to say, in that in that tech forward bucket. Not that you're in any way behind, but just not at the leading edge, if you will. Do, do either of you think that what we're seeing now in the market, which, you know, let's face it, is a meltdown of sorts for certain parts of fintech in particular, is that the justification for not being at the leading edge of something like technology? And again, maybe not a coincidence that most of the companies 
that are perennials on this list are more of the traditional bread and butter community banks. Like if, if both of you could respond to that, that'd be great. Maybe Tom and then Mark. Yeah, I'll be, you know, I've never been a huge FinTech fan. I never understood most of their business model. You know, so far, I mean, I saw their business model and they refinanced high rate student loan debt for smart people that went to Ivy League schools. They didn't go to Alabama, University of Alabama. Um, so I, I get that business model, that, but, but a lot of these fintechs are just, you know, they're just money brokers. They're, they're, they're raising money online. They, 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 the, the customer base is an online presence. What always tickled me is they, they advertise at the Super Bowl, but then they say they're an online company. So why would you advertise at the Super Bowl with expensive what it was an ad cost a million dollars. If you say you're an online company, why you're just on the internet, people find you on their internet. Why would you buy a Super Bowl ad? So, you know, I've always sort of been a, a, a betting on the dump line on the uh, fintechs. I'm curious at what Mark seems to think. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say first that we are a, you know, traditional bank and that's what we do. We are not a technology company. Um, we use technology to provide products and services to our customers. Um, and that's how we kind of think about technology. Um, we, we, our strategy has always been to be fast followers. And what I mean by that is we, we are very plugged into what uh, the current technology is in the market most of it is that comes out of fintech land is uh, not worth it, right? It's a it's a it's an extremely narrow uh, application of something that could potentially improve some element of what you do, uh, but is usually not worth the squeeze. Um, you know, technology is really expensive. Um, it doesn't usually save you costs. It usually costs you something. So unless it's additive to the customer experience, we're not going to use it. Um, I think with respect to technology in terms of serving our customers, my goal is to have a, a essentially uh, a technology platform that can do 90% of what Bank of America or JP Morgan could do. They have office towers of, you know, coders and tech folks and researchers, and we'll let them figure out what works, watch it. And if there's high consumer or business demand for it, we'll adopt it. Uh, if there isn't, we're not going to spend the time, energy and money on, you know, chasing rainbows. So I think, you know, the whole fintech, it, it was obvious a couple of years ago that there was too much capital going into fintech. Um, and I think it's interesting because when, when, when fintech started raising money from banks, that's how you know all the smart money was already in. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I'm not surprised that, you know, technology, it always, it's the beauty of our, you know, our capitalist system and the beauty of of the, the, the tech world, it's, um, you know, it's the, be it's the best in the world, um, but it's basically, you know, creative destruction and it's a cycle of that. So we just don't have the expertise or time to, you know, to chase it. I wanna use those products that make sense for us. And so we, you know, have a very good pulse on those products in the market that are getting high levels of acceptance and penetration by actual users. That we will look at. Beyond that, you know, we're not we're not gonna we're not gonna chase it. Got it. You know, on that front, I just wanted to, you know, fintech is that word, that buzzword, but frankly, you know, banks have been engaging with technology for for decades and decades. There's things around efficiencies and automation that could make banks like yours, you know, even more potentially profitable. Is that on the agenda? You know, engaging technology to that extent. To you know, maybe shrink you know uh, uh, full time employees, automate processes, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> in fact, we have a significant project underway right now to invest in. Um, uh, let's call them our tech people call them bots. 
Uh, yeah. But it's it's essentially programming routines that automate things that right now we're doing with a spreadsheet. And according to our CTO, his goal is to take out uh, 60,000 hours of process time. Yeah. And Tom, your your bank's efficiency ratio hovers around 30%. I mean, that's extraordinary. He doesn't have expenses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you must be in, in investing in technology if you're back off. You're, I'm sure your back office is very efficient. I, I just wonder if you had any take on this this conversation, no, I, this part. No, our, our back office is, is not very efficient. Um, and I don't shouldn't say that in such a, a blunt manner, but, you know, our front end is what's efficient. I mean, we have, you know, find me another bank our size with 24 branches and four LPOs. They don't exist. So that's where the efficiency mm -hmm. is. And so, you know, I've continually are, uh, had are, uh, discussions with regulators since we founded the bank because they seem to think that our low efficiency ratio is because we skimp on back office expenses, mm -hmm. which we don't. But our back office, we benchmark it, and we're pretty average in terms of we're, we're – probably no more efficient than an average bank. We're probably in the 50th percentile. So we've got a lot, a lot of work to do to, to automate as well. And, you know, it, it's amazing from a managerial standpoint, most, many of our people still think about the way we've been doing things for the last 20 years. And there's new technology available that they are, are very slow adapters to. So the, the challenge is to get, to challenge them to adopt technology to improve. Sure. Yeah, that's a big that's, you know, that's every bank out there is, is going through those struggles, too. So we're almost out of time. I'm going to uh, basically bring us to a last uh, a last topic. And we always ask this, Joe and I, on these webinars, we like getting your opinions. It's kind of a big picture question. So we're soon heading into a new year and setting aside your own company's outlooks. What's maybe something that you think will be sort of an out of consensus surprise development? within the banking industry next year, good, bad, you know, just curious, you know, to, to, as to what, you, what may be a consensus viewpoint right now that you think might turn out to be incorrect. Um, Tom, since you're up, why don't you, why don't you take that first? Sure. I think the biggest surprise will be for investors is that we will, the industry will not have the significant credit losses that they're expecting in a recessionary environment. And, and, and I'm not assuming that we're going to have an 08 or 09 again. I don't think anybody's assuming that, but you know, our corporate borrowers are more liquid than they've ever been before. Our commercial real estate uh, portfolios have significantly more equity than they've ever had in the past. So, you know, I think the industry is ready for, for a downturn this time. And I think they'll be surprised at the lack of a lack of credit losses. Is the market skittishness, Tom, just kind of how the market is? The market seems to disagree. I, I agree with you 100%. Um, you think it's sort of a remnant from 08 that we're dealing with with the market, where once kind of banks go through a real downturn and COVID didn't count, right, for a whole number of different reasons. But you think you think that's sort of the turning point for bank stock average bank stock valuations is proving we can go through a down a real downturn without it being an 08 or 09 type experience? Yeah, because you know they they're just assuming it's going to be like the last and and yeah. state is worse than than I think it's going to be. I mean, you know, I'm I'm an optimist by nature. I'll admit that, but you know, I just think we're like I say like, for those two reasons. I just on the corporate and the and the CRE side, I think we're much more prepared today than we've ever been. Hmm. Mark, did you want to chime in on, on your uh, on what Tom said or also other prognostication for next year? Yeah, I, I mean, I think if you, you think about the next year and you think about kind of the questions that investors are asking us, right, and thinking about, um, I would agree with Tom completely on credit. I don't think it's going to be uh, as bad. Uh, uh, as maybe some might be concerned about. I, I think the risk, and I don't, I'm not going to prognosticate anything, but I think the risk, the biggest uncertainty headed into next year is, you know, does Fed funds go to six or does it go back to one? 
and you know the the impact of that and you know it could be that it just goes to wherever people think it's going to go to whatever it is five or something but um you know does it go much higher than that or does it reverse course because of the economic environment and go you know go back down so i, I i'm not making a prediction i'm just saying i think the biggest area of risk in terms of uncertainty and the impacts that that might have on banks different ways right is it if if rates move way back up, that means one thing to the banks. If rates move way down, that means another thing. So to me, the biggest risk is that there's a, you know, an, another outlier move in interest rates next year, either up or down. And, and I think that's that the uncertainty around that and the impacts on, you know, potentially credit, but, you know, liquidity and growth and uh, margin and uh, funding and all those things, depending on, Again, whether up or down, uh, I think that's the big, the big uncertainty and the big risk headed into next year. Is Mark, could that there's an outlier move in rates? Mark, could could that move to the upside in rates? And for Tom too, could could that change your view on credit? Like, is there a threshold level? I know it's hard to predict that that view that you that you articulated on credit earlier. Both of you changes. Or not, not in the, not, not in the, you know, the foreseeable future of rates is, are six percent instead of five percent, right? Yeah, I don't think that's going to move the needle a whole lot. I think if they go to eighteen like they did in the early eighties, then that's a, that's a different story, uh, or even something obviously less than that. I, I don't see a, you know, modest continual move up in rates having a material impact on credit at all. I think that if there's a spike in rates for some reason. Um, you know, inflation gets wildly out of control. Um, that might have kind of unanticipated impacts on credit, certainly on, you know, the ability of certain customers to service their debt uh, and, and demand. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't know that if it's a garden variety continuation of the evolution of rates up, it's going to have a significant movement on the ultimate, you know, next credit cycle. But uh, so we're out of time. I, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Tom, so much for being with us. It's been a really great, insightful discussion. Um, and uh, I really appreciate you spending time uh, with uh, Joe and I today. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Joe.